everybody, let's swim by get ready. Yeah, yeah, get ready, everybody. Cause it's breakfast with Bob. Macho Man, everybody. Day four, breakfast with Bob. We're here at Huggles on the Rocks. My name is Bob Babbitt, brought to you by Master Spas. As fuels go longer, Hoka, let's fly. Deborah Wetsuits, Forum Smart Swim Goggles, Zoot Sports, original triathlon brand, Quintana Roo, Premium Plus Sports, and our Challenged Athletes Foundation. From Hoka, Mr. Eric Gilson and Mr. Mike McManus. You guys are having a busy week, Mike. So far, so good. You know, I just, I, I'm super smiling because we just got serenaded. This is uh, <laughs> That's pretty cool, what I, huh? Beyond what uh, my expectations are already. But, yeah, very busy week. So, Mike, when Hoka first got into triathlon, I mean, you come from a solid running background from way back. What was it about this sport that was important enough for you guys to invest in? Early adopters, uh, you know, triathletes are all about innovation, all about every possible advantage to help them maximize their performance. And so, you know, triathletes found Hoka. It wasn't the other way around, to be fair. Yes. And then... There's this guy that got involved. That let's say he's got some history in the sport, uh, e.g. Eric Gilson in, and uh, the rest is history. But, you know, triathletes found uh, Hoka and obviously to, to help them maximize their performance. So for us, it was a, a really, really easy fit. I remember being at Wildflower when this guy, Eric Gilson, in first showed me uh, Hoka when you guys were first getting started. And Eric was there being a Cytomax, he had Power Bar. He sort of has seen brands start and understands how to get them to that next level and connect with the pros and the age groupers. What did you see in the shoe right away that made you realize that was special? Well, I've been wearing them since, uh, well, right away when they first came out. And uh, we had 100 pair in 2014. And we sold out Tuesday afternoon and Wednesday. The at, rep at had to order another hundred. They were overnighted. They came here Friday. He pre-sold them. And we blew out two hundred pair. And that's when I got the call from Hoka, and they said, "Hey, we have track, trail, and road pretty much covered, but we need a little help in triathlon." And I knew exactly how to do it. You were my second call. I <laughs> called Julie Moss first, and then Dave Scott, and the rest of the elders of our community. But you know, building brands and releasing them to the community, especially when it's a real good product like Hoka, it's a pleasure. Mike, how do you balance, you, you got Tri, you got Road, you got Trail, your, your heritage is Ultra. So balancing all that, where you invest, obviously a brand like Ironman, if you're gonna be in triathlon, if you've got Ironman, you've got it, right? And then when you're in Ultra, if UTMB is it. You guys have been in both, both of those major brands are part of your portfolio now. How did you? How do you balance it all? I, I think that's it. It is trying to balance uh, those four. So between road, track, try and trail, you know, with uh, trail we have UTMB and that partnership, and of course Ironman has a, a connection to that as well. And and that is our heritage. That's the genesis. Uh, you know, Ironman and triathlon's been with us, as Eric was saying, uh, really the start uh, 2014, but officially it began the partnership with Ironman in 2016. So that's been an investment, of course, that's expanded. And then, you know, there's this road and track element uh, or those pillars. And, and, you know, we're working on each of those uh, uh, at the same time. So, you know, just in the last uh, six weeks, you know, I could bore you, but I, you know, no, I would say yeah. that uh, there was that Nice event, right, the Men's World Championship. Yep. But before that, Ooh. we were at UTMB. And, of course, uh, before that, uh, we had 70.3 worlds going on in Lafia, and, uh, and then we were at Budapest for the uh, Athletics World Championships. Uh, then come back around, and, you know, we had uh, Chicago Marathon last week. We had athletes competing there. Uh, we have this event. We have New York City Marathon coming up. Uh, and, and so it's been uh, – oh, I, and I missed and Riga. The, and, and also you missed – it's an Olympic say, year. Heading into Olympic year. And, oh, by the way, we got this little thing called the Paris Olympics coming up. So, <laughs> yeah, it is a balancing act. Um, as you have seen, Bob, we have a lot of boots on the ground here, and there's a huge investment that we have uh, – um, into the sport of triathlon, and, and you see it come alive in Nice, you see it come alive in uh, 70.3 Worlds, you see it come alive at almost every event, and you see it c coming alive this, uh, this week. So, Eric, this week, in terms of activation, talk a little bit about what you guys are doing here on the island. Sure. Uh, the medical conference, you know, we have yes. the doctors so important to the triage. When the athletes come across the finish line, they go to the uh, medical tent if needed. Those doctors come out here for a medical conference, get continuing education points. We presented there with a woman. Uh, 
Ashley Norton. She's racing, pacemaker, she has MS. She's gonna get across that finish line before midnight. Uh, we did an interview with her. We gave away 150 pairs of shoes to the doctors, the nurses, the medical people that save lives, the hands that heal. So uh, we started there. Uh, we were up in Kona Coffee and Tea. We have activations there up Hoka Hill, formerly Pay and Save Hill. Uh, the uh, Expo, we have uh, booths. We've had a women's panel at Papa Kona's with our top pros and age groupers and influencers. Uh, just goes on and on. We've got uh, quite a team of veterans uh, together. And Mike and I have known each other 30 years. He was my old track coach at the Golden Gate Tri no Club. No way! Uh, yeah, in the early 90s. How I'm bad was he? Oh, I was <laughs> off the bat. Uh, there's no change, actually. You know, he was he was a big talker. And I say, there's time to talk and there's time to run. Yep. <laughs> and he said, I think I'd rather talk. <laughs> yeah. but, but your background, yeah. you grew up and running in NorCal as well. And uh, talk a little about your the trail running that you did growing up. Oh man! Yeah, quite a bit. Uh, you know, less intense than all the options you have. But yeah, my you know my father got me started. I'd say my parents did. Uh, my uh, dad got going as well as my mom in the late '60s, early '70s. The Dolphin South Inn Club in San Francisco, and you know I grew up in Oakland and come over and, and run races every Sunday with the DSC and then follow my dad uh, primarily to marathons and around the Bay Area, all the local race. And then he was doing this strange trail race called the Dipsy, you know, which is the second oldest race in the country behind the Boston Marathon. And so, yeah, I matriculated through high school and, and college and then got, uh, you know, into like local national scene competitively, but especially, let's say, on the trail. And, uh, and then as I started to move on, uh, got involved with coaching, and, you know, that's how I connected with this guy as well as then, uh, you know, started into the, the industry back in the mid-'90s. So, but, Dipsy, uh, when did you first run Dipsy? How old were you? I was uh, nine in 1975. <laughs> yeah. That's child abuse. Yes. 49. <laughs> he ran a marathon with his dad at nine years old. At nine think. years old. And his dad did this race in 85 and Western States in 85. <laughs> That's crazy. A Navy officer. Yeah, engineer. my dad actually, uh, so he, he did Western States a couple times, 80 and 81. And then, you know, the next step was, of course, Ironman. And his big concern, and maybe a concern for a few out here, was the cutoff times. Of course, back in the day, it was far easier to get an entry into Ironman, and, uh, but he got through it. He, he barely made the swim time. You know, I follow in his uh, footstep in swimming. I'm terrible, but uh, he, he got on a bike and made that work, and you know, his forte was running, and uh, he, he got through it, so yeah. How many Ironmans have you done now? Zero. <laughs> Good man. <laughs> but he's done a 222 Zero, so marathon in Detroit back in the day. 222, 222. now that's real running. And when you first ran in the Hocus for the first time, did you know you had something special? No, I you, quite, Quite frankly, I was still with a competitor, um, living abroad, uh, working at their global headquarters, and, and I, had, I was speaking with uh, Lee Cox at the time about joining Hoka, and uh, I got a hold of a pair, and I was shocked. I was absolutely shocked, and it took me a good half a dozen runs to really understand the shoe because it was so different from anything yes. I'd else have thick. run. It just looked thicker, The right? high stack, it was so lightweight, but the stack heights, the, the rocker element, all the innovative things that go into Hoka, first time I'd experienced it. I'd never experienced it, and so it really took me, you know, it took me right out of what I'd been in for many years, and it took me a good, uh, you know, probably six runs to really feel like, wow, this is not just different, but this is empowering, and this is, uh, this is crazy good. What fascinated me right away is at that point, the minimalist m movement was going on. Oh. Barefoot and, and Newtons and uh, the, the Vibram shoes, all that type of crazy stuff. And one of my buddies, one of our therapists in San Diego was like, that was the best era for me in terms of clients. People would, would put on those Vibram shoes and they're like, okay, born to run, I'm going to run barefoot. And they'd pop their calf after 10 miles. And, uh, but you guys were just the opposite. Right? You had the minimal shoes, and then you had Hoka's, and all of a sudden, you saw the product just take off. Yeah, per perfect timing, per perfect storm with exactly what you said. The, the entire industry was trying to figure out how to build a better minimal shoe. Right. Which was keeping a lot of physical therapists and chiropractors very, very happy. It. And it was the people best. People were trying to relearn foot strike and that sort of thing, and you know, natural foot strike. But uh, you know, Hoka went polar opposite of that, and you, you, you do see that reflected in the rest of the industry to this day. I mean, it's, and you see the performances uh, throughout. So you know, there's, there's something to that. It is, 
you know, it's, it's, it's a better form of allowing the athlete to right. perform their best when it counts them out most. And how important when you get a Daniela Reef and a Jan Frodeno running in the product, how important is that he having the very top athletes running in your product because they can run in anything and they're not going to just choose something because they're getting a paycheck if they can't win the race because that's their legacy especially at the level of the, the, the point they're at in their careers how important is that a wide base of support works the pyramids are still up in egypt for a reason you have a nice base of support just like the shoes in hoka well we have some elders in the sport come to us on the advent of the end of their career we help them out we give them an extra year or two we want to make sure that they make the most of their career you only have so many races in your life as a professional to earn money uh, so it's been a pleasure to have these athletes uh, come to us, but we also seek athletes out. Being a race announcer, I keep an eye out on the talent coming up, and right. I've watched a lot of athletes over the years show character, sometimes good, sometimes bad, and that's where we seek them out. We want great athletes like Heather Jackson, uh, like the athletes we have right now. A lot of intellect, a lot of sharp athletes that are thinkers, influencers, and help others. We want good athletes, but we want good character out of the athlete. We don't want characters. We want athletes with good character. I'll tell you one of the interesting things about uh, Daniela as well as uh, Jan Ferdino, and uh, as Eric was saying, two, let's say, veteran athletes right. in the, in the Last Later years parts of their of, career, yeah. and, and you know Daniel, both of them the, certainly the goats of their era, but they're also let's say quote unquote old school, who had been in that older pre super shoe era, high stack era, and so it, you know as Eric said, they actually both of them came to us, uh, had a chance to try the shoes. It's, this guy gets uh, a lot of shoes to people, but had a chance, and they went through that same wow experience, that same like oh, I never knew, now I know, okay, there's something here. The younger athletes uh, in particular, and I, I would just say they're a little bit more open and they get it right off the bat. Yes. But let's say they haven't had that brand for you know, 10, 15 years, but you have to have a shoe that performs now. There's no question about it. Plated shoes, obviously the last few years, that's been the big topic. Was that going plated? Uh, obviously you have to, you have to be part of that, you know, that revolution. How tough was it to take a product you're already making and say, okay, we've got to rip it up and figure out how to make it a plated shoe, how to make it as fast, uh, the fast as it could possibly be? Well, when I joined uh, Hoka in 2016, uh, you know, innovation already had plated shoes. Um, and I, I got a hold of the plated shoes because I was one of the managing athletes and I was looking at what actually New Jersey, New York track club athletes are wearing. It's like, what do they have these carbon fiber flats and spikes for and so there was already that innovation happening to be clear and so you know the combination then of the carbon fiber the plates and the manipulation there along with these new super foams it's the combination that with the high stack that has now been the let's say quote the secret sauce that has allowed the athletes to you know not just perform and maximize their but but i think one of the other big secrets is the recovery time uh, now bob and when you're out here you know, think about this race on Saturday. You know, the athletes, when they get in their running shoes after T2, at the very least, they've been out at least five hours, you know, up front. And yes. so they're already beat to a pulp. And so their bodies are already, you know, in a, in a very fatigued, weak state. And so they need every ounce of energy, but also recovery. So if they're just that every step they take, if there's just a little bit less pounding, if they're getting a little bit more back, it adds up over a long time. And then not just performance, but then the recovery time is so yes. much faster, and that's what we're seeing, that combination. That's what I'm hearing from the top pros. They're saying, hey, yeah, they certainly make me faster on race day, but also by, rather than Thursday of the week after, by Tuesday, my legs feel way better. It's, it makes a huge difference. And E is somebody who's been running forever, did, could you tell right away that this was going to be an innovation that was going to stick? Oh, absolutely. First time I tried them in 2011, I knew. And then the new plated product, uh, I do get to try a lot of shoes and do give away a lot of shoes. And I hear the feedback from the athletes. Like When I hear from Makili Jones, Heather Fuhrer, these are real runners. We yes. know that. When they come back and say, wow, this is a really a great shoe, I definitely take that back and let everyone know at Hoka. And, uh, we've got a great crew in research and development, the real runners themselves, and they're passionate about it. How are the, when you're talking about ultra runners who are doing UTMB, how are they different from the, the, your top athletes who are racing here? They're not. They're not and at and all, right? And that's why the move, the, the genesis of the brand, you know, figuring out how 
you know, these athletes that are going up and down the French Alps could survive over a 20 or 30 hour long race. When you look at the fatigue level that's happening with the poundings and the quads and that sort of, and you transfer that to triathlon, again, a, a race that's gonna take uh, eight, nine, 10 plus hours. These athletes are trying to get under the cutoff this week and uh, there's no difference in terms of the body fatigue, in terms of the pounding effect, uh, in terms of uh, trying to regulate uh, temperature as well as hydration, that sort of stuff. These two athletes, they're both such long endurance athletes. They're very similar. Maybe the ultra athlete, the only difference is they even have a more accelerated version from all the pounding because they don't have you know, the opportunity to get on a bike and they're right. working, but they don't have the pounding effect. So maybe it's a little bit more accentuated in running, but it's really, they're very, very similar athletes. What's fascinating is when I had Competitor Magazine, we do shoe reviews like twice a year. Originally it was once a year, then it was twice a year. Now, then it became like four times. How often are you guys releasing new product and how much pressure is there to come up with something new? Uh, I mean, it's, it's, this is the most exciting time in the industry period in my lifetime. And I think between the three of us, yeah. we've been around many decades, but it's never been more exciting to be part of the running industry because you know, when you look at the running industry in particular versus some of the other, let's say, more innovative industries, as far as the history, like cycling, let's say, right. or even swimming, but cycling is great where innovation is always at the forefront. Every year, it's, it's something is new, aero position, one more gear, you know, this is how we're getting the bike lighter, all that kind of stuff. Running is really playing catch up, I would say. It really is. So that's what's so exciting. So the fact that, yeah, if we have to play hurry up offense, if the industry is looking now and, you know, the, the door is wide open as far as what materials are there, what the stack heights are there, the position of the shoe. It's not just, hey, there's a cool new design. So innovation is now at the forefront in the running industry. And this is the most exciting time, I, I would say, that for every single brand that it's ever been. I couldn't agree more, because when we look back at the, at the history, yeah, I would always tell people, and everything, oh, the athletes are so much faster than I. But, well, let's go back to 89, guys were swimming 50 minutes, and Mark and Dave ran 240 and 241, you take the transition out, it's 238, 239, nobody was running that fast, right? From 1989 until just a couple of years ago, when all of a sudden, you know, Gustav last year ran 236. Well, but it's been a long time, but just the cycling, when Mark Allen's fastest bike split was 428, and then they're going 404, 402. We've seen so much innovation in cycling, and it's very cool to finally see it in running. Besides just different colorway and uh, you know just a different, you know, a, a little different look. And now it's all about performance. I, I, on the running side, we are going to see the men start going under two and a half hours for sure. Um, that, that's going to happen. Uh, Patrick Long is already you know, right at, at that cusp, but uh, yep. you're going to start seeing mid-225, and, and women, you're going to start seeing oh, you know, subs. Yes, exactly. No so, question. And, and on Saturday out here, you know, I, I can see sub-820. Uh, you know, I, you look at the splits uh, you know, all the way across, and it's going to take a sub-245 to win no question. on Saturday. Well, we just saw it, what Daniela Reef did at, at Roth. I think she had her fastest marathon ever. Right, and she goes eight away, takes 10 minutes off of Chrissy Simon. Actually, from my perspective, when people say who's gonna win, I always look at sort of the intangibles. Chrissy Wellington just happened to be in Roth this year when uh, Danielle is breaking her course record by 10 minutes is there at the finish line. Natasha just happens to be here, who's from Switzerland, has six wins, Daniela has five, and could be at the finish line there as Daniela comes across tying her record after Natasha's getting off. I mean, sometimes things are meant to be. I mean, you had uh, you know Lucy out there pulling, of course, and then this young Taylor Nib that's just you know spectacular. Uh, you know, it's great. There's, who knows? And there's then a bunch. Chelsea Zadaro that can outrun anybody, and then Daniela that's the goat, and that's a pretty darn good. Laura uh, Phillip and Cat Matthews. You can go on and on, which I love seeing the women's. Now, are you guys? fans of we've got women only here, men only in Nice, and this is the first time this has ever happened. It's really important for the sport, and, and when we came into it, of course, one of the things, not just in triathlon, but overall, is you're really looking at how to make sure that both genders have equal opportunity. Yep. And this is the, you know, on the women's side for sure, you know, Kona is the most important event. Uh, you know, even the, even the men would say, hey, could you, would you rather win Nice? And Nice was spectacular, or Kona? Men are saying Kona. Oh, big time. Kona, for sure. And, and that's not to, uh, you know, to knock Nice, but History. This, is gonna, this is clearly going to be a showcase for women. Now, we're really hoping that when you still look at the discrepancy in gender participation, 
you know, between men and women, this is going to help equal the playing field. Because yes. ideally, I think we all want to see, you know, 50% men, 50% women. You see that in a sport like running. No reason it can't be the sport in triathlon, but I think it's going to take something like this isolation, the focus, and really highlighting the women here. Say, okay, yes. take a look at this, and we'll see the effect in the next decade. Well, we saw that when you know the when competitor group, when we were part of the rock and roll, and rock and roll to 60% women, changed the whole face of running. And when you look at triathlon, the shorter the distance, the more equality there is, right? It's less expensive, so you'd see 50% men, 50% women in all the races I do, all these pool triathlons and short distance, because the swim isn't as daunting when it's shorter, especially if it's at a pool. But then as your distances go up, when you get up to a half, a 70.3 and a full, the numbers drop off substantially for, for women. So something like this could be the showcase we need to start getting those numbers towards 50-50. It's a different year. We've had the 7 o'clock start, mass start, then the pros would start at 6.55, and then the mass age groupers, and then the men and women would be separated. But, you know, to have, and the, we all have our purpose here. And when Paula was making her win, she'd have to make her way through the age group men and then into the men right. pro that she'd get past. And, you know, we all had our purpose then. But things naturally progress. And to have the women showcase their talent this week out there and not have the men in the way, but they're just not there. It's not like they were a distraction. They were all part of the course in the past but this is the now this is the future and to be able to have them on their own showing that yeah we're not air we're not ducking behind age groupers to get to uh, Javi we're able to just do our thing so it'll be great not to have the men not in the way but just they're on their own the women are going to be able to show how solid they are and women have had such a long history of governing and leading this race so it's a natural from valerie silk to sally edwards to you know diana of course i mean to, sharon to, ackles yep, god love them air all the way across the line yep. we've always been about and I've, there'll be a piece of video that i helped script tonight talking about the history of iron man and the history of women and how women in look at other sports in tennis it's three sets rather than five sets in basketball they use a smaller ball in tennis they play on a lower net i mean in uh, volleyball they play on a lower net so women have always been thought of as okay we got to adapt the rules there was no adaption here. Not here this has always been about you make the cutoff times and you become an iron man you don't make the cutoff times you're it doesn't matter male female equal opportunity abuser missing an hour missing a, it doesn't matter get to the finish line that's all that matters makes this race special Appreciate all the support you guys give to oh, our wow. sport. It you know what it does when when a big brand like Hoka invests in the sport and invests in these events. It shows people it's important and it's needs necessary. Thank you guys. Thank you, Bob. It's a win-win. I love it. it. Big E, thanks for everything you do, my well, man. Well, thank you for everything you've done. You have made such a huge difference in so many thousands of people's lives, the family of the challenged athletes, the athletes themselves. I love working with you, and I love you, Bob. And this event is just a, we call this the appetizer for the best day and try oh, next oh. week. <laughs> and we'll be back <laughs> in again. San Diego. Pacho Man, take us out. All right. Good morning, everybody. It's breakfast with Bob. Yeah, yeah. Good morning, everybody. That's with Mike and Ron. Yeah, Pacho Man, everybody. Yeah.